Today's message is for uh, those 336 people, as we get into the word today, um, who for the last seven days, they gave their lives to Jesus last Sunday, and maybe you can relate to this. And for the last seven days, the enemy has been trying to convince them, you are still the same person you were seven days ago. You are not the same. You have not changed. It was an emotional response. Nothing really is different. It's also for the 3,500 other people that are called Journey Church home here and at our East Campus who show up every Sunday and have been showing up every Sunday for months and for years who the enemy is still trying to convince. You've been a Christian for, for so and so long, but you're still the same. You still have the same struggles. You still have the same doubts. You still have the same worries. You have not changed. If that's you, I want to encourage you today with the title of my message so you can look at your neighbor and you can tell them, but look at them like if they were the devil. And tell them, I mean, love them, but also don't punch them, but also just with authority, I want you to tell them the title of my message because you're going to need to say it on your way home. You're going to need to say it tomorrow morning when you wake up, everybody who's getting baptized. You're going to need to say it in the mirror this is the message. I'm different now. I want to tell them, I'm different now. I'm different now. I'm different now. I'm different now. This is what baptism is. It is telling the world, I'm different now. So if you were my friend before getting baptized, before giving my life to Jesus, and you're my friend after, you can still be my friend. Just know I might not laugh at the jokes that I used to laugh at back then. I might not go to the same parties that I used to go to back then. I might not drink the same drink that I used to drink with you back then. I might get the club soda today, okay? Because I'm different now. It's also a reminder for those who are watching those people getting baptized that you are different now. Well, I'm in the same situation. Yeah, but you are different even though your situation is the same. You think about it different now. You look at it different now. It, doesn't, it might affect you, but it didn't affect you like it used to affect you because you're different now. Despite what the enemy might tell you. And yes, we have an enemy. His name is the devil, Satan, Lucifer. Call him whatever you want. One of his names is the father of lies. You need to know that the devil is a liar. The Bible says that when he speaks it, he speaks his native language. So like I speak English, some people speak Spanish, the devil speaks lies. That's his language. And what he's going to try and tell you is despite all the things that God has said about you, that you are still the same person you were before you met Jesus. Which has led me to this conclusion. The devil is the original gaslighter. Now, if you're like me and you do not keep up with the lingo of today, uh, I heard this word about a year ago. I had no idea what it meant. Uh, I just pretended like I did. You ever been in a conversation with somebody, but like, he's gaslighting. You're like, yeah. I yeah. And so I had to Google it and I looked it up. And so this is the definition of gaslighting. Someone who tries to manipulate another person by making them question their reality. So like parents, just like when you tell your kids, if you get an A on all your tests, we're going to take you to Disney. Kids are like, that's awesome. Then they get all A's, and then they come to you after they get all A's with their report card, talking about when we go to Disney. You look at them, and you go, I never said that. I never said that. What are you talking about? And the kids are like, I'm pretty sure you said that. Dad was there. Dad, weren't you there? I never heard that. I never heard that. No, uh-uh. It's like when your spouse is, when you guys get together and you decide who's going to do what chores. I'll do the dishes. You take out the trash. Awesome. And you, then you do the dishes. Honey, what's up with the trash? I never said that. I never agreed to that. I said I would do my dish and throw out my trash. I didn't say I'd do it all. It's funny when you look at it like that, but it, on a deeper level, it's a really a, a, a psychological and emotional abuse. Here's how I know the devil is a gaslighter, because the very first words to come out of his mouth, recorded in scripture, are in Genesis 3.1. And here's what it is. Did God really say? His whole existence is to get you to question what God has said about your identity, what God has said about your children, what God has said about your mental health, what God has said about your body. His whole existence is to get you to question it. Here are the three types of gaslighting. How you know what's happening? Listen, when you are denying that an event took place, even if there is evidence to prove it. And so the devil would like to tell you, you're not different, even though for the first time in years you came to church last Sunday. And you came back this week. That sounds different to me. Even though for the first time in years, you had a conversation with God. 
this week. And it wasn't even like, oh, my God. Like, it was an actual, authentic prayer. Even though you haven't had a panic attack in six months, the devil wants you to believe you still wrestle with anxiety. Even though you haven't drank in two years, the devil wants you to believe you're still an addict. His whole existence is to get you to doubt what God has done in your life. The second one was making the victim feel like they are crazy or overreacting. Oh, you gave your life to Jesus last week. Now you're going to go jump in the pool. Sounds like an overreaction to me. Now you're going to go get in a group. Now you're going to go come to church every Sunday. Just, sit, just simmer, down, simmer down. It's not that big. of a, It's an overreaction. Actually, after what he did in my life, Res- this seems like the proper response to resurrection. This seems like the proper response to blessing. This seems like the proper response to a second chance and a third chance and a fourth chance. This seems like a, if you knew my testimony, you would know this is the proper response to my, my actions. The last one is manipulating the victim's environment to make them question their reality. And so you feel like, oh, the church loves me. Jesus loves me. Then you come to church one Sunday, and the greeter outside didn't see you, so they don't say hi to you. And then all of a sudden, it's, this church is not full of love. Nobody likes me. This is just like my last church. I'm going to get hurt. Manipulating the environment to plague on your fears or manipulating the environment to plague on your failures. This past Sunday, you got saved, and you did the same thing this week that you did the week before you got saved. And the enemy would like to tell you you're the same person, except this time you felt bad about it. Because last week when you did it, you was chilling. But this week you did it, you're like, dang, I was at church last Sunday. Come on, Jesus, we could do this. It's a different response. You are different. Say amen. amen. Last week, my message was Jesus changes lives. This is my message this week. Jesus changed your life despite what the enemy would have you believe. He's changed your life. Here's how you're different. Now, all of my points are written in the first person because I'm not just giving you points today. I'm giving you tools today. I'm giving you weapons that you can use when the enemy tries to plague on your identity and tries to plague on what God has done in your life. Here are things that you need to say. So here's the first thing I'm giving to you so you can stay changed. Here we go. My name is different now. I'm different because my name is different now. With us, a name is really no more than something you put on an application. But in biblical times, a name was representative of a person's character and their calling. And it's so amazing how many people actually embody their names. Like, I have two kids. I named them Justice and Zane. And Justice, if you know Justice, he's very just. I didn't know that when I named him, but he does not like to see people get picked on. He doesn't like to see people get bullied. If he sees that something's not fair, he will fight you for it. He's very just. Zane is a Hebrew variation of the word John, John the Beloved, who was always reclining against Jesus. Zane is very, his love language is physical touch. He loves to hug people. He's, He's a great friend. He stays close to you. It's amazing how much We live to our names, which is why whenever God met somebody in the Bible, I mean, really met them and encountered them, oftentimes the first thing he would do is change their name. Because what he's trying to tell you is that who you are after you meet me is not who you are before you meet me. You're a new person. You're a different person. He took a man named Abram and changed his name to Abraham, which means father of multitude. He took a woman named Sarai, named her Sarah, which means mother of nations. He took a man named Jacob, which means deceiver, which is so interesting to me because before Before he ever deceived anybody, he already was labeled a deceiver and then ended up deceiving someone in his life, which tells me that we will often live up or down to the labels that people assign us. And so if you're a parent in the room, you got to be careful. The labels that you assign your kid, you're so stupid. Now he's going to have that label. He will live down to the label that you assign to him. Whenever you're correcting your children, make sure that you're correcting the action, not assigning a label. What you did was stupid. That was a stupid thing to do, but you're not stupid. You're smart. You're wise. God's given you, God's given you insight. You're, you're a smart kid. Always put encouraging, never, never negative labels because they will live up or down. God changed his name to Israel, which means wrestle with God. God took a man named Simon, changed his name to Peter, which means rock. But what I love about all of those names, here's the revelation. 
that all of their names were changed before they did anything to deserve that name. Abram's name was changed to Abraham, father of multitudes, before he had one kid. Sarai's name was changed to Sarah before she had one kid. Jacob's name was changed to Israel before he became a nation. Simon was changed to Peter before the church was even in existence. Why? Because change begins with who, not do. Before you can change, listen, before you see your behavior change, you have to change the way you see you. Because identity gives birth to action. Let me give you some examples. When you know who you are, first off, you don't reply to the old name. When you got a new name, you don't apply to the old name. I've been living at my house now for, babe, eight, nine years? How long? Nine years? Nine years we've been living at that. Wow, that's a long time. Nine years we've been living at our house. Are you sure it's not eight? Yeah, so what is it? It'll be eight. Eight years. Eight years we've been at this house. 8.5 years we've been living at this house. This is compromising marriage. 8.5 years. <laughs> and yesterday, I got mail for a Maribel Santiago. I have been getting mail for Maribel for the last eight and a half years. Every week, Maribel got mail. Maribel, if you're still watching, <laughs> come get your mail, girl. It's been coming to my house for the last eight and a half years. But Zane, his responsibility when his choice is to go get the mail. So for, he got it. He's like, Dad, Who's Maribel? Like, is that some name that mom used to go by? And I'm like, I'm like, nah, man, that's the person who used to live here. And he was like, should we open it? I said, no, I don't open it. He said, why? I said, because it's not addressed to you. It doesn't have your name on it. It doesn't have my name on it. See, when the enemy tries to send you mail, when the enemy tries to get you a message, before you even entertain the thought, the question you got to ask is, but is that my name on the envelope? Because if that's not my name, I'm not even going to think about that thought. I'm not even going to entertain that thought. Are you ready? Because that person doesn't live here anymore. It might be the same house, but it's not occupied by the same person. It might be the same body, but it's not occupied by the same mind. It might be the same flesh, but it ain't occupied by the same spirit. It's a different person on the other side of that mail. And so when the enemy tries to send you mail, now this mail came through my mailman, but your mail could come through the bully, the boss, the spouse, the kid, the parent, the, the co-worker, whoever sends that mail, you need to look at it real quick and that's it. Oh, that's says failure. I'm sorry. Before I even go down that train of thought, my name's not failure. Colossians 1.15 says my name's forgiven. And so I'm going to have to just reject that, put that aside and... And, it's not, and that's not me. That, that male says mistake. Oh, I'm sorry. You got this confused. Mistake doesn't live here. According to Ephesians, masterpiece lives here. It says masterpiece. That's why, that's why I'm God's masterpiece. Well, you kind of also a mess. Well, have you ever seen a Picasso? Ears over here. I didn't say I was perfect. I said I was beautiful. That's what God said about me, that he can take my mess and turn it into a masterpiece. So I'm going to just reject that old name, not even going to entertain that, but also because I got a new name, I'm not going to reject the old name, and I'm also going to live up to the new name. Live up to your new name. A lot of people have never read this in the book of Revelations. I'll preach on heaven in the fall, um, but in heaven, something really cool happens, and a lot of people don't know. Revelation chapter 2, verse 17 Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone. Look at that. With a new name written on it. Known only to the one who receives it. Now remember that a name is representative of your character and your calling. So when you get to heaven... There's going to be a name on a rock that God gives you, and only you and him know it. And it's a name that represents your true character and your true calling. In other words, you're not what they said about you on earth. I'm going to tell you who I created you to be. This is the real you, which is so cool an idea because that means you're going to want to write this down. That means there is a you you haven't met yet. There's a you 
You haven't met yet that's still in process. There's a you that's in development. There's a you that is disciplined, Gio. There's a you that does have organization. There's a you that is fulfilled. There is a you that is called. There is a you that is in your, in your profession. There is a you that is satisfied. There is a you you haven't met yet. I love that. I love the fact that God says, I'm going to give you a new name. One, because it's, it, only you and him know it. Because you know what you call names that only you and one other person know? Nicknames. And a nickname is something based on intimacy that two people share. I love God. It's like when, when you get to heaven, God's going to be like, hey, all the things that we went through, look, look at that right there. That's you and me. We know. You know. It, it insinuates his intimacy in our life and how he was with us every step of the way and how there's experiences that only he and I know. And that's why he, he's the only one who saw me cry that night. He's the only one who saw me break down that day. And so that name is indicative of that, which is beautiful. But I also love how he's saying, this is the true you. That person on earth, that name, that, they, that was never you. So here's how this works. If you want to overcome gossip, if you're a gossiper and you want to stop gossiping, change your identity first. This is what you say. As a follower of Jesus... I'm called to love and speak well of others because of who I am in Christ. I will build people up rather than tear them down. Because that's what followers of Jesus do. You want a better marriage? Change the identity first. Ready? Husbands, here you go. Because I am a godly husband. Okay, now, if you're a godly husband, what do godly husbands do? Once you get that identity, because I am a godly husband, I will pray with my wife daily, and we will be a part of a marriage small group together that will help us have a better marriage. If you want to quit smoking and you go to work and someone asks you, hey, do you want to sing? Hey, do you want to puff? Hey, do you want to pull? I don't know what kind of smoking you're trying to quit. But hey, if you want to, what, 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 you want to quit, don't say this. Don't say this. No, thank you. I'm trying to quit. Here's what you say. You say, no, thank you. I don't smoke. It's not who I am. Are you with me? And when you change the way you see yourself, then what you do will follow what you see. Say amen. Amen. Here's the other thing you're going to change now when you give your life to Christ because you are a new person. I'm going to talk differently to myself now. I talk to myself different now. Stop talking to yourself like the old stuff. And by the way, before you get crazy, we all talk to ourselves. Everybody here talks to ourselves. But here's what we don't do that we need to start doing more of. Are you listening to yourself? We all talk to ourselves, but are you listening to yourself? Do you hear the way you talk to you? You would never talk to you. You would never talk to a person the way you talk to you. You would never. You have so much more grace for strangers than you have for yourself. Proverbs 18, 21 says, the tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Are you ready? Here's what it's saying. If you speak about your life in a good way, you will lead a good life. Because from it comes the fruit. This is supported by the fact that when God created the world, he said, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. If we are truly made in the image of God, what the Bible says is true, then that means our words make our world. Because God's world, God's word made our world. So the words we speak become the world we live in. Change the way you speak about yourself. When Jesus died on the cross, we were, we were open to eternal life. But what allows that eternal life to get into us? The Bible says if you believe in your heart and confess with your that Jesus is Lord, then you shall be saved. So not only do words create worlds, words give birth to new life inside of you. But here's the one I really want to hit. James 3.3, 3, when we put bits into the mouths of horses, we make them obey us. We can turn the whole animal. Verse 5, likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great bows. Raise your hand if you've been horseback riding. You've been horseback riding? Raise your hand. Okay, a lot of people horseback riding. I remember going horseback riding in Costa Rica with my wife. It had been many, many years since I had gotten on a horse, and I've forgotten just how terrifying it is. The moment you get on a horse and you see that that horse is 10 times your size and, that, and, it starts, and it's going wherever it wants to go. And I'm just thinking the moment I got on that thing, I'm trying to look tough for her. I'm like, this thing at any moment can step on me, kill me, kick me, knock me off. And I'm just trying to be like I saw in the movies with the cowboys. And, and I remember asking the guy who was leading us, like, how do I control this animal, which is so much bigger and stronger than me? And he said, that little thing that you have in your mouth, that little bit, it presses 
presses up against certain nerves in the back of their tongue that are very sensitive. And so you don't need to control the whole animal. You don't got to be stronger than the whole animal. But if you can just control the tongue, the whole animal, the whole animal, all of its unruliness, with all of its strength, the whole animal will follow the direction of the tongue. Because we go, here's what I want you to learn, the way of our words. We go the way of our words. So I'm going to help you out. Here's some things we're going to start doing differently. I'm going to speak kindly to myself. Speak kindly to yourself. We would never talk to people the way we talk to ourselves. And here's why I think we talk to ourselves that way, because we're really trying to punish ourselves. But why are you trying to punish someone who's already been forgiven? That don't make sense. I remember when I was a teenager, I had done a sin that was pretty bad, and, and I just felt real bad about myself. And I remember we were at a lock-in. It was a youth lock-in. And it was actually a church lock-in where you stay up all night and pray. And I remember half the night, I was saying, Lord, forgive me. Lord, forgive me. Lord, forgive me. I'm so sorry. Lord, forgive me. Lord, forgive me. And about three hours into my prayer, I, I don't think, if you would ask me, have I ever heard the audible voice of God ever in my life, I would say maybe twice. Not even for sure. I don't know if it was the pizza I ate the last week or what, but Maybe twice, but one of those two times was that night at a lock-in where at a, about three hours into the prayer, I was saying, Lord, forgive me, Lord, forgive me, and I swear I heard the Lord speak back to me. He goes, I already forgave you, now forgive yourself. And I'll never forget it, and I'll never forget it. You can be kind to someone who's already been forgiven. Here's another thing. I'm going to speak patiently to myself. I've noticed, I've been yelling at my kids a lot more lately, pray for your pastor. And I apologize to them every time I do it. I know it's wrong. But I think the reason why is because now they're turning 12, 11, hitting those teenage years. And I'm tired. When they were kids, I expected less because it was the first time you heard it. (laughs) But now, we've been living together for a decade. And if by now you don't know to put back your towel when you're done taking a shower, I don't know what else to do (laughs) but lose my mind. (laughs) Why have I lost patience? Because I got tired of saying the same thing over and over and over again. The reason why we lose patience with ourselves is because we stop speaking is because we're tired of telling ourselves the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over. But here's what I learned with my kids. Ready? It doesn't make it any better. It doesn't help them get any better at all. I got to come at them with the same love, the same compassion. And here's the last one. I tell myself a different story. You got to tell yourself a different story. When I'm at the gym, sometimes the weight gets too heavy and it falls. And, and there's a name for that. When you work out to the point where you can no longer lift the weight any longer. It's called, do you know what it's called? Yeah, it's working out to failure. Well, failure is one word for it. You know what another word for it is? Training. You know what another word for it is? Growth. Because in order to grow, you got to get to the point of failure. So that next week, you fail that 200 this week. Next week, you're going to fail at 202.5 and 205. And over time, that's called progressive overload. You get stronger and stronger and stronger. You could call it, I'm trying to tell you, how about you tell yourself a different story? What if last week wasn't failure? What if it was progressive overload? <laughs> What if it was growth? You're the one in charge of that narrative. And let me tell you, you're going to tell yourself a story no matter what. Might as well make it one that's built on faith, that's built on the Word of God. Might as well be the story that God tells you about yourself. Here's my last point. Listen, now that you're different, I'm doing something different now. I'm doing something different now. I love Craig Rochelle. He's a mentor of mine, and he's a pastor out in Oklahoma. He wrote a book uh, called The Power to Change. I recommend it if you're looking for a book on developing habits. It's called The Power to Change. And... um, In one of it, he has a chapter called Flossing Saves My Life. And I'm not talking about the dance. I'm talking about flossing. Saved my life. And in it, he says, I hate flossing. I hate flossing. But he started a habit doing it every day. He needed to because I needed to start, put on the screen, flossing my teeth to convince myself that I am a person who chooses what's right over what's convenient. He has a lot of habits, reads his Bible, goes to the gym, eats right. He says, but the first habit that I ever installed in my life was flossing every day because I had to convince myself that I could stick with something daily. Once I could convince myself that I could stick with something daily, then what I changed to stick to my life changed every year. But it was something I had to convince myself of first. Isn't that good? 
I'm telling you that your, your actions, even if they're little, over time, what they become is they become investments in your identity. James 2, 17, 18 says this, in the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Verse 26, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. I wanted to become a gym person five years ago. I made the decision I wanted to become a gym person. And so what I would do is I would go to the gym three to five days a week, no matter what. And there were some days when I was real tired, real tired. And I went, literally, I went, and I did like three curls, and I went home. And that wasn't most days, but some days. Because well, why don't, if you're going to do that, why don't you just stay home? Because I was trying to create a narrative in my life that I am a person that goes to the gym. I am a gym person. And for the last five years, I would not have described myself as a gym person who likes going to the gym. And the other day, my son asked me, he goes, Dad, you must really like going to the gym. And because I got so used to the narrative in my head, I said without thinking, oh, no, I don't even like the gym. But then I had to stop and I go, but bro, it's been five years and you've been going five days a week for five years. At this point, you probably like it. And I stepped out, I was like, you know what? I think I do like it. I think I do like it. Hold on, I got to take that back. Yeah, I like going, but I didn't at first. Four years ago, I had trouble reading my Bible every day. So I started a, a Bible reading plan, went to the Bible in a year. Some days I wouldn't read the Bible. The next day I would try and catch up. Some days I couldn't go through that whole list. There was like eight circles and I couldn't get it on my new version. So I just went to Psalm because it looked like the shortest one, but I read it because I'm not trying to read my Bible in a year. I'm trying to be a person who reads the Bible every day. Now, after four years, I can tell you I'm a person that reads the Bible every day. So you got to make choices. So listen, your choice can be, I want to be the kind of person that goes to church every week. Even if I'm not feeling like it, I'm going to come in. Even if I come in for the worship and leave before the preaching, <laughs> don't do that. That would hurt my feelings. But if you wanted to, you got to make the choices. You got to make the choices. Little choices. I'm going to be the kind of person that prays every day, even if I'm not feeling it. Even if I sit down for 30 minutes or for 15 minutes and I don't think I got something out of it. You, did, you might have not got something out of it, ooh, but you put something into it. You put something into it that is going to pay a return on investment in your identity. And so really quickly, if you bow your heads and close your eyes, I want to pray for all those who are wrestling, who have been Christians for years. You're wrestling with your identity. You're wrestling with whether or not you've changed. You've changed. Jesus changed your life. God, I pray for everybody in the room today. Last week, I said Jesus changes us. This week, I'm saying he changed us already. He already changed us. I promise you, you're different. You're not the same. You're a new creation. You're new in Christ Jesus. Step into your identity. Live up to your name. Put away the old name. You're forgiven. You're a masterpiece. You're called. God's got his hand on your life. Step into who you are. Stop believing the devil's gaslighting you. It's not the same. And even if it's the same, you're not the same. You're different. Why? Because God said so. Because God said so. So I'm going to live my life based on this new identity. In Jesus' name. In that same spirit. Listen, I don't think there's just little changes we need to make. I think sometimes there's big changes we need to make. And there's a lot of big changes that we can make in our life. And one of the biggest changes is giving our life to Jesus. And if you're in this room today and you would say, you know what, or watching online, you're saying, listen, I, I think I'm ready for a big change because what I've been doing has not been working. That's you on the count of three. I want you to raise your hand high. Every head, but every eye closed, you're in this room. I want you to raise your hand high. I'm ready to give my life to Jesus today. And because uh, it hasn't been working and I need a big change. I want to be different. I'm going to do something different to be different. All over the room, every head, but every eye closed. Raise your right hand if that's you. One, three. One, two, three. Hands high, hands high, hands high. I see your hand. 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 Praise the Lord. You can put it down. We're going to pray with you. You are not alone. All over this room, I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Everyone say, Father God, Father God today, today, I want to be different, I want to be different so I'm going to do something different. So I'm going to do something different. I've tried other ways. I've tried it has not worked. Has not so, worked. Today, so today, I choose to follow you, Jesus. I, follow you, Jesus. I, give, you I give you my life. I give you all of me. I, give you all of I want to follow you, Lord. I, want to follow you, Lord. I, accept you, Jesus, I accept you, Jesus, as the Lord, as the Lord and, Savior and Savior of my life, with the promise, with the promise that after I say amen, that after I, say amen I, will be I will be different. different. In Jesus' name we pray. Jesus amen, name amen and amen. Come on, put your hands together to welcome those who made the decision to follow Christ.
Hey, we're JJ and Liz Vasquez. We wanted to say thank you so much for watching and engaging in today's content. Maybe today you made the decision to follow Jesus. We want to celebrate the incredible decision that you made. All you have to do is text JOURNEY to 55498. We would love to walk this journey out alongside you. Hey, and don't let the journey stop here. We love for you to do one of three things. Subscribe, share, or support. If this ministry has blessed you at all, subscribe so you don't miss out on any new videos. Share with a friend. You never know what the people closest to you are going through. Or you can choose to partner with us through generosity, which helps bring these videos to people just like you. Thank you so much for connecting with us. Be blessed.